Good afternoon. I am Patricia Kane, the Friends of American Arts Curator of American Decorative Arts here at the Art Gallery. Welcome to our e-study tour of the Leslie P. and George H. Hume American Furniture Study Center uh, here at Yale's West Campus. Uh, today, we are joined by John Stuart Gordon, my colleague in the American Arts Department, who's the Benjamin Atmore Hewitt, Curator of American Decorative Arts, and Rebecca Tannenbaum, Senior Lecturer in the Department of History at Yale. And they will lead us on a tour uh, and discuss furniture made for and created by women. Rebecca often uses our collections in her teaching and John often participates in her classes. So they work collaboratively, collaboratively together uh, or have on many occasions. But before we dive into the program, um, a couple of technical notes. If you are indeed having technical difficulties, you can uh, enter those into chat and someone should be able to help you. If you have questions for John and Rebecca, please put those into Q&A and they will be addressed at the end of the program. So John and Rebecca, please take it away. Thank you, Pat. Um, the idea for this talk actually originated in the temporary exhibition that's currently on view at the Yale Art Gallery on the basis of art, 150 years of women at Yale. And I was part of the really large team that um, helped create this exhibition. And I've been thinking about women makers, women owners, and it seemed like a good opportunity to explore this uh, theme in a slightly different context. If this were a different time, we would be gathering together at Yale West Campus in the Leslie P. and George H. Hume Furniture Study. This extraordinary resource uh, opened to the public in the fall of 2019, had a few good months and then shuttered again. And we look forward to being able to welcome, welcome you back in person before too long. Until then, Rebecca and I are going to lead you on a virtual tour down these aisles and uh, stop at some of the objects that kind of excite us. Uh, we won't talk about everything. We won't be able to discuss every topic. Um, we may not even agree with each other. It'll be fun, uh, but we'll have, um, we'll talk about some things and we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions. So as Pat mentioned, if you have a question that percolates along our journey, please enter it into the Q&A and we'll circle back to it. Um, with that, Rebecca, let's walk down the aisle and get to our first object, which is this um, chest with drawers. Um, it's actually, it's one of the oldest objects, it is the oldest object we'll look at today, but it's one of the more recent additions to the gallery's collection. And it was a recent gift in honor of my colleague, Pat Kane. This is one of about 125 recorded Hadley chests. Uh, this term is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, the first chest of this type that was described was found in a house in Hadley, Massachusetts. So all of the chests are now called Hadley chests, but it's a, it's a regional form that was popular up and down the Connecticut River Valley. And this type, um, identifiable because a few of the details, of, for example, like the little checkerboard in the center, um, is associated with Hartford. So from Hadley, Massachusetts to Hartford, Connecticut, you see chests like this. The form is simple. It's a frame and panel construction. Um, other household furniture would be made this way. Your house actually may be made using this type of construction. It's really forthright. What's spectacular is this profusion of flat carving um, that covers it. These flowers, leaves, stamens, pistons, rather sexy um, carving. Um, and this example has some remnants of its original paint. So we're looking at a very dark, somber object. You have to imagine this red, black, 
Some examples have blue and white. And it's all on top of freshly um, hewn oak, which would be buttery yellow. So imagine away this very genteel uh, color palette and think splashy. Rebecca, how would this object have fit into the life of its owner? Well, these uh, Hadley chests are uh, usually were usually made as dowry chests for young women um, on the occasion of their marriage. So they contained the, the property that a young woman would have brought to the marriage and of course were also part of that property. Um, what was inside were her valuables um, and mostly what was valuable were linens and, and other house, pieces of household uh, cloth. Um, now that doesn't sound like a very valuable object, but you have to remember before mass production, cloth was scarce, hard to make, and very expensive. So a set of household linens, which would include bed sheets and tablecloths and napkins, really represented a substantial investment um, for the young woman's family. And just to understand how valuable uh, these, this cloth was, um, there's a probate inventory, and of course, in a probate inventory, uh, every object in a household is given a value. Um, and on this particular inventory, one embroidered linen napkin was valued at three shillings. But you have to remember that at, this, at the time that this probate inventory was made, um, land was selling for four shillings an acre. So that single napkin was worth almost as much as an acre of land. Um, I also just wanted to talk about the decorative motifs in a slightly, uh, in, in a different way. Um, they are gorgeous. Um, a lot of these motifs are very similar to what you see in embroidery patterns at the time, the leaves, the flowers, the pomegranates, all of these symbols of fertility and, um, and lush life. Um, so the pattern on the outside of the chest is reflecting the contents of the chest. Um, and once these chests were placed in a household, they would often be draped with more cloth and sometimes household silver would be displayed along the top. So you have these as an important display of wealth. Um, and as I'll talk about more in a minute, they're also a uniquely uh, female form of property. Yeah, it's, it, here's a, the detail of that center panel, which I think beautifully shows um, this kind of abstract carving and it really shows the point Rebecca was making about the links to embroidery and cruel work. It's, it's a great observation. And at the center of this panel is um, two stylized S's. And that's, those are the initials probably of the owner. Um, and infuriatingly, um, this chest does not come down to us with a history. Most furniture does not come down to us with a history. So SS is, lost to time, um, but was probably the initials of the young woman for whom this was made. Uh, and when Rebecca and I were talking about this um, in preparation, we said like, oh, it's awful, SS, who knows who SS will be. I put on my, my miner's cap and I went diving into the marriage records um, in the Hartford area in the late 16, 1600s. And amazingly, SS is a very popular man's initials not so much for women. And uh, there was a Sarah Smith who marries John Spencer in 1693. And there's a Susanna Scott who marries Thomas Shepard in 1695. There are probably more out there, but it's nice to be able to be like, okay, well, maybe we have an idea of one of the households that this could have come out of. And one of the interesting things to remember about these chests is that the initials and as we'll see in a moment, um, the names that were inscribed on them are the woman's uh, maiden name, not her married name. Um, and that was because this is her property that she is bringing into the marriage. So even though she loses her name as soon as she's married, her name or initials remain the same on this chest. So it's a way of preserving that part of her heritage. Um, and uh, something else that John and I talked about when we were preparing this talk was how difficult it sometimes is to find women in the archives, um, in part because their names change. 
Uh, as soon as a woman marries, her name changes, and that's her name in all of uh, the records from the, thenceforward. And if she marries again, her name changes again. So it's sometimes very difficult to trace a woman's life because uh, because her name changes so often, or at least once uh, during her life. But they are preserved. The maiden names are preserved on these uh, dowry chests. Yeah, this may be a great example of that point. Um, we've just walked around the corner and come across this chest, which is made about 100 years later, but not much has changed. Um, the cabinetry has changed. This is made um, using dovetail joints that if you look close at your screen, you can see them peeking through the blue paint to the corner. Um, it has kind of very up-to-date bracket feet. It's, it's a more sophisticated object, but it's still a rectangle. Um, divided into square frames, and then the frames are filled with uh, stylized floral motifs. So it's that interesting to see this arc, this aesthetic arc that remains kind of fixed for about a century. And the scholars have associated this chest with um, the Lehigh County area of Pennsylvania based on other examples, um, more firmly documented examples that have been found in that region. Although some um, with this large central heart have also been found um, to the southwest of uh, Pennsylvania in, um, in Lancaster County. This one is tantalizing because it has a name and a date and we love that kind of thing. And it's, so it's Margareta Bonin's um, chest and you can see the date 1788 bracketing her last name. When this was published uh, by the gallery, um, and for much of its life, we had no idea who Margareta Bonin was. And uh, I, I was able to locate the, um, the records of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Schaeferstown, which is in Lebanon County, uh, Pennsylvania. And this is right actually in between Lehigh and Lancaster County. So that, um, so it's in that kind of that, that region in the mid area of the state. And the 1783 list of communicants for the church lists Margareta Bonin. And this is the only trace we've been able to find of this, this woman um, in the historical record so far. There's more out there. But um, it's rather intriguing because why does she only appear this year? I mean, is she, and um, it's not, and the list is, there are not a whole lot of Bonins. It's not the whole family, it's just her. So does she come alone to this region and comes to the church? Or more, more likely, because it's the list of communicants, these are the people who are now active members of the church. She may have just come of age and she is now an, an official member of the church. And that's 1783, and this chest is marked 1788. Five years difference. So maybe you know, in that five years of coming of age, now she maybe she's ready to be married. And I said earlier these were uniquely female forms of property. Um, one of the differences between inheritance patterns for young men and young women is that young women often got their full inheritance on marriage rather than upon their father or their parents' deaths. Um, so they got their legacy uh, early, often, um, just before they exited the family. But what's interesting also uh, is that these chests were often passed down in a female line. So a woman might pass her chest down to her eldest daughter, just as a man might leave the majority of his real estate to his eldest son. Uh, and the historian Laurel Ulrich has uh, traced another one of these Hadley chests um, through several generations of women in Massachusetts. Um, and of course, they change their name with every generation, um, but the chest remains the same and remains an important part of both an emotional and um, an economic legacy. And what's fascinating about that is also, so it, you know, the, the, the object becomes the fixed point in an ever rotating galaxy, but the names off, are often passed down too. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone who's done any kind of historical sleuthing knows that you may find you know, the Susan Smith you're looking for is also has a daughter named Susan and a granddaughter named Susan and a great granddaughter named Susan and a cousin named Susan. And um, 
So the memories come down through the objects, but also the naming as well. Which is another thing that sometimes makes it hard to trace people in the archives is that the names, and, and this goes for both men and women, remain the same across generations. And it's hard to tell which um, Susan Smith or John Smith you're looking at in the, in the records. True. True. I want to um, whisk us upstairs to the second floor, to the mezzanine of the furniture study, and to look at this glorious array of work tables. Um, we could spend an entire day just diving into each one of these, but uh, Rekha and I both have a favorite, and it both happens to be the same one, which is really convenient. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to really um, hone in on one particular table, a rather spectacular object that was made in Philadelphia. And historically, it had been associated with um, Henry Connolly's shop because of these beautiful attenuated legs that are almost like columns, reeded columns with um, very stylized um, acanthus carved capitals. When my predecessor, David Barquis, was studying this um, in preparation for a catalog, he took it apart and found a little inscription um, in one of the structural elements that said Robert McGuffin and the date 1808. And sure enough, Robert McGuffin worked for Henry Connolly um, and made at least part of this table. So we could actually locate it in a shop in a city at a particular time, which is fairly rare. Um, the table came with very minimal historical documentation. Um, the the family knew that it would, had been made by uh, for um, a Sarah Teresa Pratt, and um, that she lived in Philadelphia. But that was, and we knew her death date. That was pretty much it. But it's always been a kind of a spectacular thing on its own. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the form, um, it's a great. It's a, it's a gendered form, which is a fascinating story in itself. Many of them. Um, the large, the basket or this kind of upholstered uh, protrusion at the bottom is on rails and can slide out and becomes like a big catch-all drawer. This example is a little different. The whole top lifts up and um, hinges back and reveals internal compartments. And this one retains its original robin's egg blue lining, which is just you know, fabulous. And bigger compartments or medium sized compartments for some medium sized objects. They're tiny little drawers tucked in the cavity for maybe small things like thimbles and needles. And then the bulk of it, um, you could probably put large, large objects. So, um, as you may have guessed from that description, the kind of work done with this work table was fancy needlework and embroidery. Um, the needles, the embroidery silks, and then, of course, in the larger compartment, um, you have uh, the actual piece that you're that you're working on, as well as perhaps extra fabric or whatever. Um, so, as John said, this is one of my favorite objects, as well as one of his favorite objects. I love it because it is so feminine, and I'll explain like the gendering of this piece of furniture, but it's so feminine that this table actually literally wears a skirt. That green swag looks a lot like women's skirts of the time. Um, but also it really demonstrates um, another aspect of the way that textiles and needlework were kind of the essence of femininity in early America. Um, not just what women did on an everyday basis, but also symbolically. They were symbols of femininity and feminine virtue. Uh, one of the favorite Bible verses of especially New England ministers when they preached on, on um, the virtuous woman was from Proverbs 31 with the verse, uh, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. And so this work table embodies that. Now, of course, the young woman or girl who owned this um, was an affluent, from a very affluent family. I mean, you can tell just by looking at um, this piece of furniture. Um, but these young women still did needlework to demonstrate their good character. Um, idleness was considered a terrible sin. Um, uh, just kind of 
a little bit of a, of a tangent, um, around the time this uh, work table was made was the time when novels were becoming an important art form. But novel reading was very frowned upon, especially for young women. It was considered idle. It was considered too emotionally exciting for young women. Um, needlework was how they should spend their leisure hours. So hence, hence this work table. Um, hard work was also associated with American virtue. Um, idleness and frivolity was part of European decadence. We had just you know, separated ourselves from that. Um, so it's also a kind of patriotic statement to have your daughters doing this elaborate needlework to demonstrate their virtue. Um, but of course, the work done with this work table was probably very fancy sewing and embroidery, not you know knitting warm socks or making work, work shirts. Um, so it's also demonstrating the household's wealth and sophistication. Um, while still not falling into that sinful uh, frivolity and idleness. Uh, now, something that, that John discovered, and I'll give him all the credit for discovering this, is that uh, Susan Teresa Platt was uh, 11 years old when her parents gave her this work table. Um, and that seems, you know, to our modern sensibilities about childhood, you know, would you give something like this to an 11 year old? Um, but uh, 11 year olds were working on samplers, as we see here in, in this slide. Um, and this was a chance to demonstrate all of the embroidery stitches they had been learning since they were old enough to hold a needle. Um, so they would be, Miss, Miss Pratt got this work table, she began working on her sampler, and probably eventually she also started embroidering the napkins and tablecloths that would be part of her. Um, dowry when she herself got married. Yeah, and I'll add that um, she was the daughter of Henry Pratt, who was an incredibly wealthy merchant in Philadelphia. And uh, she marries in 1819 to a young man from Baltimore and takes the table with her and kind of moves and sets up shop. So it is, it's very much part of the movables of the, the, the household and because um, it's on our minds, um, I was looking and I saw that there were reports of a fever epidemic that broke out in the early 1820s. Um, it started in Philadelphia, the epidemic spread throughout the uh, mid-Atlantic states and um, in 1822, Susan Teresa Pratt Mayer with her, maiden, uh, her married name, she succumbs to a sudden and unnamed disease, um, which I assume is probably part of this fever epidemic. And, um, and to Rebecca's point, we found the obituary. Um, and it is a wonderful thing because this young woman has, has recently passed away. And, um, you know, the, the obituary says, you know, the virtues of departed relatives and friends are often magnified by affection of their survivors. Obituary notices sometimes present but a feeble likeness of their originals. With rigid trust, however, it may be said of this lady that her character was strongly marked by an uncommon purity of heart. And it goes on and on, and then it mentions and domestic virtue, which endeared her to all around her. So even in her obituary, this idea of the, the, the virtuousness of a woman's domesticity is very um, centrally located. So it's fascinating to kind of see how, yeah, the young woman may grow up, but the, um, the box she's placed in kind of travels with her throughout her life. <laughs> both literally and figuratively. <laughs> yes. And to Rebecca's point that this is wearing a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you can really see the similarities between uh, Mrs. Elliot's uh, gown and especially the sleeves and the ruffles on, on the uh, work table itself. Um, I also just wanted to call attention to uh, Mrs. Elliot's uh, handbag. Um, it's so prominently displayed in this painting, um, and I think this is demonstrating, first of all, I am sure 
although I have no evidence for it, but I am sure that she embroidered that bag herself. So this is another example of, of domestic virtue and needlework and its association with femininity. Um, it's also kind of interesting moment in the history of fashion. Um, around this time is when handbags actually became an object of fashion. Um, there were a number of reasons for this, uh, one of which was the changing shape of dresses. Uh, dresses at this time had, as you can sort of see in, in the painting, an ampere waist and a much narrower skirt than what had gone before. Um, so why does that mean you had to carry a handbag? Well, as some of you may know, up until this time, women had carried what were called pockets. They weren't sewn into the clothing, but were little separate bags, often elaborately embroidered as this handbag is. And actually this handbag is very much the shape of a traditional pocket. Um, and these pockets, instead of being sewn into your clothing, would tie around your waist, like um, what we'd now call a fanny pack. Um, and there was a slit in your skirt so you could reach in and access your pocket. But with the changing fashions of the late 18th, early 19th centuries, um, they spoiled the line of the gown. And so handbags became the important accessory. Um, and eventually over time, both tie-on pockets and sewn-in pockets disappeared from women's clothing. So <laughs> the reason we women cannot have nowhere good to put our keys and our phones these days is because of handbags like Mrs. Elliott's from, uh, the, er, from the late 18th century. So there's another little digre historical digression for everyone today. And I will note that the upholstery on the work table is a reproduction, but it's based on a plate from Thomas Sheraton's Upholster and Cabinet Maker's Guide from 1793 of a very similar work table that has this rather fluffy um, skirt, which, and, they, and those, the dependencies even look like pockets. So like the dress, the, you know, it's wearing a skirt with pockets. Um, <laughs> I, um, David Barquist, my predecessor, has, has noted that actually probably a more appropriate um, addressing for this table would probably be pleats. Mm. And it would probably make it look more en pure and probably more like turn of the century fashion. So um, one of these days, um, you may come back to the furniture study and see the work table in a whole new dress. So we're going to go around the corner to an object that it's kind of easy to walk by when you're in the furniture study, but it's a truly remarkable thing. It's this pull screen. Um, it's one of a pair. Um, they were both made, um, each one was made by a, a sister, um, Mariah and Sarah Levitt. Um, Sarah Levitt is at Historic Deerfield and um, the very restrained neoclassical uh, armature is been attributed to Daniel Clay, who was a cabinet maker working in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Pole screens are a curious form because um, they're neither fish nor fowl. They're, they're ostensibly a piece of furniture, but, uh, and their, their job is to block a draft or, um, or block light or heat. And there are stories of, in the days when women's makeup was kind of wax-based, um, women being inside with a roaring fire and feeling their makeup melt and a pull screen or a table screen was a useful thing to block the heat. It's a great story. I have no idea how true that is. Um, but you get a sense that um, kind of the real work of these objects um, is as, a, as an easel for a spectacular piece of wood or a rather elaborate textile that is framed and held aloft as um, on this example. And it is a rather extraordinary um, textile. This is signed along the bottom by Mariah H. Levitt, who was a young woman who um, grew up in in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Her father was Jonathan Levitt, who was an attorney. Her mother was Amelia Stiles, who was the daughter of Ezra Stiles, um, a well-known minister. And for those of us 
who know Yale, he was the seventh president of Yale University or Yale College at that point. And so this is a very erudite family and it just kind of shows the um, economic and cultural capital that was kind of focused in the, the professional class and the kind of the, the minister class in this period. And Mariah and her sister were educated briefly at Deerfield Academy, um, where this may have been, been constructed. Right. I mean, this is an example of the expanding educational opportunities for girls in this time period. A lot of these young ladies academies sprang up all over uh, all over America, especially here in New England and in the Northeast. Um, they taught academic subjects, as you might imagine, history, literature, um, geography, as we'll see in a couple of objects from now. Um, but they also taught other kinds of skills, including embroidery, watercolor painting, and kind of social skills like um, music so that you can play music to entertain your family and social dance as well, which was an important social skill. Um, and a poll screen like this would have been a kind of senior thesis for a young woman about to graduate from one of these academies. Um, it is both watercolor and embroidery, so she's demonstrating two of her skills, and it is so elaborate and so fancy. And of course, it was designed to um, be displayed in her parents' parlor, as this one surely was in this beautiful um, um, stand that they, uh, I assume, had made for it. Um, a lot of uh, the imagery in these uh, sen senior theses, um, uh, embroidery projects was patriotic. Um, you can see here, uh, we have an eagle sort of surmounting the whole thing. Um, the rest of it is, is landscape, which was another common motif. I know John said to me when we were um, talking about this, that it really looks like this is taken from life in some way, that it's not copied from a print as some of these scenes were, but um, might have been a real landscape that the artist uh, knew and decided to portray in, um, in, silk, and, in silk and watercolor. Um, but you often also see like very much more explicitly patriotic imagery in, in, these, um, in these embroideries. Uh, there's a there was a famous print that showed the figure the female figure of Liberty um, holding up her hand to feed the American eagle with a with a flag in the background, um, and that was a very uh, I think done more than once as one of these uh, final projects. Yeah, I will add that. Um... A former fellow in our department, Corinne Eskridge, did a fair amount of research on this stand and um, the work table we'll look at in a little bit. And she wrote a wonderful article that was in the 2018 Bulletin of the Yale University Art Gallery. So if you're inspired by these objects, um, go and look for that. It is online, um, it's available through JSTOR. And Corinne was um, also due the connection that um, Jerusha Mather Williams was the preceptress at Deerfield at this time period, and she actually may be the one who laid out uh, key elements of this composition. Mm. Um, and so you can see it's part of the kind of the indoctrination of next generation of kind of having to recreate patriotic symbols um, and also doing copy work, just as art students would have to do copies off of uh, plaster casts. Um, and so um, Corinne and other scholars have kind of looked at, you know, thinking maybe um, Jerusha Williams kind of laid this out. And I like the idea that, you know, here these people are living along the Connecticut River Valley. Maybe these are scenes that resonate with their experience um, and the landscape they know, because everything's just a little quirky and it's, um, it's, it's idiosyncratic and charming um, in a way that makes it seem like it's not copied from a formal print source. So I mentioned Mariah had a sister and this is the work of her sister, Sarah. Um, and this may have also been done at Deerfield. Um, the timing is a little 
Thague. Um, it may have been executed at Deerfield. It may also have been executed um, when Sarah Hooker Levitt was a student at Miss Abby Wright's Female Academy in South Hadley. Um, the frame is original and it bears the label of Smith and Norton, who were um, gilders and framers in. Um, in Northampton. So between Deerfield, Northampton, South Hadley, you see um, this, this kind of close knit geography of where these objects and these people are moving between. Um, and you get the family history because this is a memorial image to Ezra Stiles, the grandfather. Um, so really kind of again affirming their, their family's role in, if not American history, Connecticut history. And uh, the, this, of course, is a memorial to a family member, but you know, we were talking earlier about patriotic imagery. Um, often you see very similar kinds of embroideries that were made to commemorate the death of George Washington. So another sort of combining these two motifs of mourning, which was also a very feminine kind of uh, topic <laughs> um, to portray, but also patriotism in looking at uh, George Washington's tomb. Um, and something else that I think it's really important to remember about these, uh, about these projects is that they were sometimes the only form of artistic expression open to these young women. Um, and I think they were beautiful examples of artwork, not just um, needlework skill. Um, but what's interesting is that the painter John Trumbull, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with John Trumbull, many of his paintings hang in the Yale Art Gallery, um, wrote in his autobiography uh, about being inspired to become an artist uh, by his sister's needlework. And I'll read you the quote because it is uh, very interesting. So he wrote, my two sisters, Faith and Mary, had completed their education at an excellent school in Boston where they both had been taught embroidery. These wonders were hung in my mother's parlor and were among the first objects that caught my infant eye. I endeavored to imitate them, and for several years the nicely sanded floors were constantly scrawled with my rude attempts at drawing. So John Trumbull became a painter because of the beauty of his sister's needlework. That's a phenomenal quote. <laughs> And here again, another great example of um, kind of this artistic outlet. Um, so another piece by Sarah Hooker Levitt. And I actually think, so there's a pull, the pull screen at Historic Deerfield, there's Yale Sampler, there's this work table that um, recently came to Yale. Um, Sarah had a drive to create and um, it is fascinating to see uh, all the different outlets and medias that she is um, that she's fueling her creative energy into. So this is signed um, Sarah Hooker Levitt, Northampton, eighteen fourteen, and you know so Northampton is where the framers of her uh, needlework are, uh, and it's speculated that maybe she had gone there after Deerfield or Miss Wrights to further um, her education. Um, Corinne uh, Eskridge has noted that there are at least three private academies in Northampton at this time that are teaching women drawing and painting. So she may have been at one of them. The form would have been created professionally, but what um, the, the surface of it was up to um, the creativity of this young woman. I think I have a detail, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, and unlike, if you imagine back to the, um, the scene, the river scene on the pole screen, this river scene is very different. Um, it's a little more composed, um, has kind of this Claudian um, asymmetry with a large tree on one side, these romantic ruins. So my instinct is that this is probably coming from a print source, um, that she's looking at a folio of prints, a book, uh, but she's copying because um, there's a kind of a, there's kind of an un-Americanness to this scene um, where the other one kind of felt more immediate. But Rebecca, this is a very, we call this a work table, but this is a different type of work. Yes, um, so you may notice this 
one does not have little compartments for needles and thread and cloth, this is a desk. This is a writing desk. Um, are there compartments in this, John? I can't remember. There are drawers. And then once um, the whole thing lifts up, there are compartments hidden. Right. But probably what was kept in there are pens and paper, maybe art supplies. Um, so this is a work table, as I said, for a very different kind of work. We're starting to move outside domesticity now. She is demonstrating her education, her literacy. Um, she probably spent time uh, on this work table writing letters, which was almost a literary form in the 19th century. It was, an, it was a genre that was sometimes taught in schools as its own uh, genre of composition. Um, so it also dem it, it demonstrates her education and it also demonstrates not so her, her domestic virtue in learning these feminine skills, but uh, like watercolor painting or uh, other kinds of painting. Um, but it also demonstrates her engagement um, with the art outside world. Um, and once again, we have this opportunity for artistic expression that we saw with the uh, embroideries as well. Yeah, I think um, we were joking when we were um, preparing that like, don't underestimate the role that letter writing played in this period. And anyone who read David McCullough's amazing biography of John Adams, Abigail was the star. And <laughs> it's like, her letters are phenomenal. And you can see, you know, it, um, although, you know, many women were disenfranchised from public office or um, owning businesses, um, they were having their opinions heard and shaping the world around them through kind of epistolary relationships and um, through the act of, of writing. So something like this becomes really kind of potent in that kind of outward movement. So I want to um, head back downstairs for our last object that you can see kind of um, hovering at the bottom of our screen. Uh, this kind of unusual thing. And I'm just going to let Rebecca launch in. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty then. Um, <laughs> so here we have another uh, final project, another senior thesis, um, but of, of a very different kind. Um, I think, uh, again, I think this is what John told me that the, this would have come as kind of a kit um, that you first constructed the globe by putting the, the different panels together and then painted in the, uh, the continents and the countries and labeled them yourself. So um, Miss Mount would have done all of that work. So she is demonstrating here a very different kind of educated skill. She's demonstrating her knowledge of geography, first of all. Um, and as I, th I know we have a, a detail, I think that, that shows her, uh, her, or maybe it's the next one that shows okay. her, her knowledge of history as well with, um, can you read that, John? I, I, yes, uh, so we, we're in the Pacific Ocean and of course, you know, she's recording um, early 19th century views of um, colony and ownership. So it's the Sandwich Isles, which are now Hawaii, um, but underneath she, she puts the, comment here, Captain James Cook was killed in the year 1799. Um, so it's not just recording the location, but what happens. And, and it struck me like this is within, you know, it's been before her lifetime, but it's the lifetime of her father. So this is history, but it's recent history that she's kind of coding onto the world. And here we have her signing this globe as its maker. Um, and I think here we, you know, we, I talked about in the previous work table about we're expanding beyond the domestic, we're showing engagement with the world. Well, this is really demonstrating an ambition to literally put her mark on the world. Um, and she did so signing and dating her work here. Um, and I think also we, we're not sure we th think maybe she was a school teacher, so it might also have been used in her classroom, um, also demonstrating her engagement with the larger world, her ability to uh, make some money of her own, um, using her education and her skills. 
So yeah, I'll, I'll add in that she was, um, so there's some debate about her birth year, but she was roughly 16 when she made this. So young, but actually not so young that you couldn't be a school teacher in this period. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have records that, um, like Susanna Rawson's Female Academy in Boston, which is um, right side of Boston, which is a very prominent um, school, young women's academy, uh, advertised teaching geography. And we know that some um, frame makers um, supplied frames for globes. So we know that this is, it, it's not a, this is a rare survival, but we know it was not the only one that was ever, ever made, which is a nice reminder. And I think it, uh, this is our last object, but I just wanted to say we've kind of moved outward, right? We started with the dowry, with the linens, with the with the importance of marriage, and then as we move forward in time, even as um, long ago as 1822, um, we start to see women pushing pushing those boundaries a little bit. And I think we can see this globe and and the way that uh, Elizabeth Mount signed it. Um, as a kind of precursor of the increasing political and social engagement of women through the 19th century. So thank you for taking this, this dive with me through some of our, our favorite objects. <laughs> These are always fun to talk about. John, Rebecca, that was really wonderful. Um, um, these, you really made these pieces come to life, life. so thank you um, very much. Um, there has been a question on the uh, uh, Sarah uh, Levitt work table, and uh, the question is, um, what is the medium of that painting? Oh, that's a great question. I don't think we've done um, XRF or kind of analysis. We just, we kind of benignly say paint, um, in our label, and we probably should look at it. Um, in the detail, you could see that there was a water stain and that the paint had moved with the water stain. So um, I assume it's going to be a, a possibly a water-based paint, um, then probably sealed in some way, but we should, um, for our knowledge and for our own being able to take care of it, we should probably have it looked at. But it's on it's on view right now, so we'll have to wait for it to come off of view. So, but do come and look at it um, in person. But I will say about the other medium, um, it's painted on bird's eye maple, which is um, there are no bird's eye maple trees. It's it's um, an irregular an irregularity and imperfection in the wood, um, which makes it somewhat rare. Um, so, it tends to be used for rather splashy um, furniture, but. When you come and look at it, note how Sarah uses the bird's eye maple in the compositions where it became like the modeled surface became the clouds above the trees. It's um, very sophisticated. You know, when you were talking about the, um, the Hadley chest and then um, Margaretta uh, Bowen's chest, um, I was really struck for the first time even though I've looked at both these objects for many years now, with the fact that um, the central flowers, at least in Margaretta's, we can see it fairly clearly in this image even, are coming out of a mound, a little, you know, little uh, mound. And the same is true of perhaps a little more abstractly in that center panel with the SS initials of the Hadley chest. And um, it, traditionally, the tree of life motif comes out of a mound. So I'm, I'm wondering, has anybody ever really interpreted these um, floral elements here as a uh, tree of life uh, motifs? Have you seen that, Rebecca? Um, um, I've seen tree of life motifs I think on some of the other chests, um, am I right about that? Um, but that's an interest. That's an interesting um, observation that they sort of substituted the name for the tree, <laughs> uh, have the name or the initials growing out of the mound. Um, and I would speculate, you know, that 
you know, this connects in some way to the idea of this being the basis of a family, the basis of a family tree. Um, I mentioned before the way these chests were handed down from mother to daughter. So maybe it's a, a sort of acknowledging that in some way. I think this is a phenomenal project for a young scholar out there. Um, because Pat and I have looked at our Taunton chest, uh, which is in this kind of idiom um, that's um, on view in the gallery that also, you know, Pat noticed that that also seems to be growing out of the mound and the connections to palampores and other textiles that share this motif. You see this um, motif a lot and often, more often than not on items associated with women. Um, it is a really interesting suggestion, Pat, and I think would make a great um, master's thesis or a final project. So um, someone get out there and start digging. Absolutely. So another participant has asked, um, when did pole screens go out of fashion? Um, they are, I think it's a fairly brief, um, time period because really their 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 high point is the Rococo and you don't really see many that predate the Rococo and then um, then you see a handful of federal ones and then by the 1840s they're gone. Um, yeah, and probably because a whole different kind of if if they were to guard against heat, let's say from a fireplace the heating technology begins to change, right? With the introduction yeah. of stoves, the Franklin stove and that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm sure those stoves still produced a lot of heat. Yeah, and then you see a revival of them at the end of the 19th century as part of the Victorian kind of the aesthetic um, interior, um, that kind of the more is more, um, let's upholster our space around us. Um, and you know, looking in like an American context, which is what I've looked at, um, you see often it's the colonial ones that have come out of the attic back down to the living room, but certainly you see those in British um, interiors as well. So it's, um, they had a brief moment. I got so excited, I just knocked my computer. Um, they had a brief moment, but um, they were never a very popular form and um, maybe we could bring them back. Someone asks, is there an example of a Hadley chest after paint analysis in a reproduction with guest original coloration? The Shelburne Museum um, did a study. They received a Hadley chest a number of years ago and they did paint analysis and they did comparisons of um, paint analysis on others. And uh, they have, um, and I think that they did a little, um, installation around it. So, and I actually do not know if it still is intact or if it was just for the, um, the installation, but they've gone down that road. Of, and that's how I knew that the Prussian blue was even discovered on these, which I thought was kind of wild. Um, and then the, you know, Peter Follinsby has not done um, Hadley chess, but he's done kind of Weathersfield chess and an earlier uh, Boston chess where he's recreated the coloration but a few have survived like Hannah Barnard's cupboard. And then there was a Hadley chest that um, came up for sale a few years ago with really vivid colors that uh, would be great to either in person or digitally restore, um, not restore the actual thing, make a replica, but um, to really get a sense of what the colors were. Um, Cause I think we will all be a bit, a bit shocked. It's like understanding that the sculptures on the Parthenon were polychrome. I mean, it's, uh, we have to rethink how we think about history. And, you know, I was really struck, Rebecca, when you were talking about um, young women doing um, their uh, needlework and probably, and the importance and value of linens in their, um, the uh, goods they brought into their marriage. Um, and I'm assuming that those, um, the, putting their initials on those linens, which we often see in ones that survive, those are probably also their maiden initials, yes? Yes. And, that's and I think, I think that tradition continued through the 19th century. Yeah, but please go ahead. Well, it also continued into the 20th century yes. in terms of silver made for women. Um, in fact, we have a, a, 
a plate in the collection that was given to us by Mrs. Griswold. And it indeed, she received it as a wedding present and has her maiden initials on it. And that was in the 1920s. So this um, use of a woman's maiden initials as signifying that these things are hers, um, really it just um, probably died when the idea of monogramming things, uh, silver anyway, died in the mid 20th century. Yes, I mean, I know I've seen, now that you mentioned it, I was thinking I, I enjoy reading old etiquette books and I remember reading some yeah early 20th century etiquette books describing the monogramming of silver and household linens and it says always with the maiden initials. Um, so that's a very long tradition and it comes from the economic basis of marriage um, you know, in the early modern period, but the tradition of marking silver and linens that way continued even when that was not as important a part of marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, John and Rebecca, thank you so much for um, this tour. It really has been um, so enjoyable, such great images and such great comments um, and knowledge that you've um, shared with us uh, today. Um, and so I just wanna thank all of you for coming and participating in this uh, program. Um, and we hope that uh, you might uh, join us uh, for another one of the e-study tours of the Furniture Study on uh, November 5th, when um, Al Albert Lakoff and myself will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of our groundbreaking exhibition, Wood Turning in North America. Um, we're going to talk about some of the stellar objects um, from that exhibition that are now in the furniture study. So we hope to see you then. Take care.